second lesson this morning continues where Al left off. And um, can everybody hear me? Okay, go. Yeah. And in it, in your bulletin, there are one or two little parts of verses missing. So just, you can listen to me and soak it all in. Uh, what we have here is like the ultimate prayer. If we think of prayer as communing with God and speaking with God and listening for God, this is about the most beautiful uh, example of prayers for the people, interceding on behalf of the people. And so here's Moses up on the mountaintop with God. God has seen what the people are doing, and he has uh, plans for Moses. <laughs> Exodus 32, chapter 7 through 14. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them on the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind. And do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Isaac, uh, Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised. I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, you do listen to us when we pray. You invite us every moment that we live to turn our hearts to you, for you are always ready to listen. Open your word this day. Open our ears and our souls that we might receive it. Amen. They love me, they love me not. They love me, they love me not. This is looking like a they love me not kind of situation. A remembrance of things we might rather forget. Moses is up on Mount Sinai in the presence of God. And we say that like it's nothing. Think about that for a moment. Moses is up on Mount Sinai in the very presence of God of the Lord God Almighty. He's not dilly-dallying somewhere at the hardware store. And while Moses and God are speaking, down at base camp, the people are growing weary of waiting. So they gather around Aaron. Think about that. They surround, feel the threat, they surround Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest, the one who in last week's reading was appointed by God to speak the words that God would give to Moses. And they say to him, come and make gods for us who shall go out before us. So was this an act of rebellion? Was it panic? Is it fear? Is it just too much kind of waiting in the wilderness of ambiguity? They could have been celebrating. Think of all that God has done to them. They could have been remembering God's mighty deeds, God's liberation, manna in the wilderness, the parting of the Red Sea. They could have been speaking with their children so that their children would remember for their children's children. But they didn't. The people have also forgotten their love for and their faith in Moses. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up 
out of Egypt. We don't know what's become of him. And Aaron, the one who's supposed to know better, the one who was called to speak for Moses, they said to him, he said to them, go and take the gold rings that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Okay, so maybe this might have been a kind of cunning plan by Aaron to stall for time till Moses got back, thinking perhaps that the ladies might not want to part with their earrings. When was the last time any of you tried to pry the shiny, sparkly things out of the hands of any member of your family? Those sparkly iPhones, Pastor Al. If that was Aaron's plan, it failed beautifully. They did it. All of the people, it says all of the people, all of the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. How ironic that the golden calf that they wanted to help them feel closer to God came from the gold from their ears. They were created by God to receive his presence by hearing his word. Aaron, this voice of God, this word of God, we like something a little less nebulous. So now what? Aaron, the high priest, the great deliverer's brother, the spokesman for the people, gives in to the people's demand. Aaron took the gold from them, he cast a mold, and made the image of the calf. The same people who a few weeks earlier, following the covenant of Sawai, pledged themselves to the Lord with these words, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now they say, these are the gods that brought you from Israel, or brought you from Egypt. That has never been forgotten. The psalmist remembers it this way. They soon forgot his words. They did not wait for his counsel. They made a calf at Horeb and worshipped a molten image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things for them in Egypt. The people forgot who and whose they are. They forgot themselves. You know me, I like words. Forget comes from the Old English. Sorry, my Scottish family. Yes, I'm saying English. From the Old English, forgetten. And that four part means kind of pushing away. It's a negative thing. It means loosening your grip. So essentially, to forget is to unget, to unget something from your mind. Why would intelligent, courageous people so recently redeemed from the cruelty of slavery by God with extraordinary deeds, extraordinary power, unspeakable deliverance, succumb to the allure of a metal cow. God created us as sensate beings. So perhaps it's natural for us to desire a sort of more obvious way to feel and know God's presence. Whatever the case, within 40 days of sealing a covenant with God, the people forget they forget their trust in God's presence and God's promises. The first two commandments are broken, and the people's short memories are exposed. They forgot the manna that God was continuing to provide for them. They forgot the hands of God that were providing it. They forgot who God is, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. They forgot the hope of being guided into the safety, into the promised land. They forgot who was meant to be at the center of their lives. And they demand, they demand that Aaron give them a God who meets their demands. They forgot who Aaron was called to be. And Aaron, he forgot himself. Moses left him to lead God's people. He's supposed to help them remember who and whose they are. And instead, he built them an altar 
an altar before this little bull he created for them. Aaron, the one called to speak for Moses, to speak the words that God would give to Moses, what comes out of his mouth? Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. If we want to give Aaron the benefit of the doubt, maybe he's just trying to placate the people's kind of increasing desperation and agitation there at the foot of Mount Sinai. Maybe he's feeling pressure to fill his big brother's shoes. In any case, let's be honest, it's not easy to go against the demands of popular culture. I challenge any of you to have a Sabbath away from your phone. Uh huh. <laughs> let's be a little nice to Aaron, shall we? Aaron makes the most of a bad situation, let's face it, and trying to avoid a mutiny of the people, maybe? Trying to redirect their hearts, redirect them towards worshiping God? And so he creates this kind of concrete or you want to call it precious metal access point so that people could feel like they knew they were in God's presence, so they would know where they could find God. We can go to the cow. It's reasonable to believe that he intended the calf to be a way for people to worship in God's presence. He was calling. After all, he was calling the people to a day, a feast day for the Lord. A day to worship the Lord. Not one of the local gods. Faithful intention, perhaps, but destructive, nonetheless. Because he's inviting the people to worship a false image of the true God. The people shouldn't have demanded it, but they did. Aaron should have said no, but he didn't. And so we can sit here today, and with 2020 hindsight, everybody's a critic, right? What would we have done? From the people's perspective, the situation is critical. They do the best they can with what they see. Their vision is limited. All of our vision is limited. Moses is not there, and God feels inaccessible. They do what all the people around them are doing. They make an idol, a tangible way to feel God's presence, God's protection and guidance and hope. And meanwhile, Moses is up on Mount Sinai with the Lord, with the Lord, no stone idol, but our living, passionate God who knows that at the bottom of the mountain, the people are having their bovine bonanza. Moses, get down there ASAP. Those people, those stiff necks people, your people, coming off the rails. My command was pretty clear. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image. How soon they forget. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. How could they forget that it is I who set them free from slavery? And so whether they are worshiping the wrong God the right way or the right God the wrong way, the Lord takes a dim view of the whole thing. Not simply the Israelites' disobedience of the commandments, but their attempt to mold God into an object of their own design for their own satisfaction. And God says, I am so angry. For everyone's sake, I think I need some alone time. But Moses will not leave God alone. Part advocate for the defense, part prayer warrior, this is not the same Moses God was talking to last week at the burning bush who tried to get out of the job that God wanted him to do. This Moses knows a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. He remembers that God has done all that God has promised. And unlike Aaron, this Moses places himself at risk in order to save his people. Unlike Aaron, this Moses is willing to say no. Unlike Aaron, this Moses shows us the power of faithful courage and the power of prayer. And Moses says to the Lord, remember your people, forget them not. 
Remember your promises. Forget them not. Moses appeals to God's faithfulness. These are your people, the ones you saved, the ones you set free, the ones you liberated from bondage with great power. Change your mind. You have given us your word. Remember the promises you made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And the Lord changed his mind. The Lord remembers. The covenant will endure because God demands the people's obedience, remembers that they will forget themselves, and forgives them. This stiff-necked people, I love that, this stiff-necked people will remain God's people because, and if you want scripture in your pocket, this is the one to have, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's this story is a remembrance of things we may have hoped were past, but not so fast. Are we so different from the people at the foot of Mount Sinai? I don't think we're that much different from Aaron. We remain a stiff-necked people, and we forget. Each of us has felt fear. And I'm sure most of us, at some point in our life, have asked God, have you forgotten me? Most of us have felt unsure in the wilderness. Will our pilgrimage lead us where we need to go? Will our work succeed? Will our children be safe? Will we find healing? Will we survive? If so, when? We mistakenly believe there are answers to every question, solutions to every problem, and when we cannot conjure them or have someone else conjure them for us, we join our fearful ancestors at the foot of the mountain. That fear reminds us of everything over which we have no control. And perhaps it is in that fear that we turn to the gold and stone idols of our own making. This story is about what happens when God's people have to wait and wait in the wilderness. How long, O oh Lord? Each of us have felt the frustration and the fear of waiting at the foot of the mountain for the test, the appointment, the diagnosis, for answers. Some of us waiting impatiently for the next step forward in our lives. Some of us are waiting in kind of a sacred time for the Lord to take us or someone we love by the hand and lead us home. We are people who grow weary of waiting. We are people who pride ourselves in clarity of purpose and prolific productivity. And yet, ambiguity is as anathema to us as it was to the people at the foot of Mount Sinai. We, too, are impatient people. We like to have a plan, go in big and win the game. And perhaps that's why we build idols to our own wisdom and our own industriousness. And before we get too smug about Aaron, forget not that by word and deed, even if we're unpopular or misunderstood or derided, we are called to be God's faithful people in the world, listening for God's word and calling one another to hear it and remember God's promises. Forget not, especially my young friends, we sometimes learn much from our failures. Forget not that Jesus, our sure foundation, built his church on some pretty crumbly rocks. Forget not the wise words of Martin Luther. This is so beautiful. That to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is, I say, really your God. The Lord says, forget me not, 
giving us a saving commandment, a saving commandment, the commandment to remember all that God has done for our sake. Forget me not, sings the living word, who has set us loose from bondage and called us to live together in faithful freedom. Forget me not, cries the word made flesh, who came to us in our fear and in our waiting that we might see and know God, who sacrificed his very self for us, for our salvation, but also for our joy. Forget me not whispers the ineffable, unexpected spirit of holiness who binds us together and sends us out into the world filled with the very breath of God. Forget not the love that is at the very heart of your God who is fiercely demanding, unfailingly forgiving, and who came down from that mountain to be eternally with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Mm -hmm.